In February 2019, youth visited Africa, Uganda and Kenya, courtesy of East Africa Records. In the short time of the visit, he recorded many of the most talented artists, play gigs in an art studio, the ghetto in Kibera, second biggest shanty town in Africa with a population of 5 million, and the National Park in Niavasha. The work from these recordings has been released on New Sounds, the EAR Ear record label. We spoke to youth about the East Africa Records project. So how did that come about yeah. in this place? Well, through um, DJing for Psychedelic Disco and Paul. Mm. And he said, oh, I've got a friend in Africa. He's interested in taking you out there for a, a few DJing gigs and a, and a workshop and studio sessions. And I was like, yeah. I was asked, yeah, I'm in. Mm. Um, it was, no, yeah, it's no money, really. And just your, the flights and stuff. Um, but I was really happy to go for the experience, and it was incredible. I had one of the best times I've ever had. Amazing experience, and uh, ended up spending doing five days in the studio with you know twenty five different artists. Wow! It reminded me of being in Jamaica in the seventies, from you know the harder they come, where all the artists lined up around the side of the studio <laughs> to play their songs to the producer. And I decided early on just to record everyone rather than sort of try and audition anyone. And we just got them all recorded and managed to turn that into a double album. And uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is in Uganda, isn't it? The studio is in Kampala, Uganda, yeah. I had no idea what to expect. Mm. There's a huge reggae scene there. There's a big traditional music scene there. And there's, uh, and there's a, quite a big beats party scene as well, you know. So, and all the artists that we recorded were a mixture of all those three, really. Young techno DJs to Bardic, Royal, Cora uh, uh, players who were aligned to certain kings. Uganda's 49 kingdoms. And the um, missionaries didn't get very far in, and nor did the colonialists, the French or the English, kind of, Kept out a bit until the I'm in, of course. But um, they retained their the culture better than other neighbouring countries like Kenya. And they, they still have the 49 kings. All those kings have bards, you know, royal poets and musicians who pro, compose and play praise songs to the, the you know, returning uh, heroes of the tribe and the society so i realized that's where our bardic idea comes from of course everything comes from africa but you think of bards as being welsh you know and and aligned to merlin or something you know in or, or some eddy pre-medieval um welsh king um which of course they were uh but all of that comes from africa it was you know that was that was really clearly uh, defined when I was working. I was very lucky and honoured to work with one of the uh, royal bards, and uh, we recorded a couple, two or three things with him as well. So it's a big bandwidth of of of, of, of uh, and spectrum of, of of music. I mean, what what's fascinating um, with with African music is, is people do have a certain perception of what it sounds like in the west and it's a very kind of museum perception of it but african music is very electronic now and very forward thinking but they somehow managed to combine mm. the, the the older rhythms but sort of mix them with, with computer generated versions of them we, I, I guess you knew a bit about this before you went there but was it a, a voyage of discovery of just how futuristic they, their thinking is well yes i mean yeah i mean i suppose you know, the, in one sense, that's one of the, the the great benefits of global culture is that, you know, people in remote places, other, way, other side of the planet, are, you know, turning onto the same things you are, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that was surprising. And, uh, but I, I suppose I, I, 
you know, I, I didn't know what to expect, really. I didn't have too many expectations of anything, really. But I did sense there was going to be some great talent there that had been a little untapped. And, um, and that's, that certainly, pro, you know, was, was very, very proven true, you know. There's so much talent, a ridiculous amount of talent. And, um, but again, I, I suppose, you know, I, I was, I didn't know what to expect in terms of when I was DJing, what people were into, you know, what, what would go down and what wouldn't. Um, but, um, again, it's, it's very multicultural society in Kampala and Nairobi, I'm a lot. Uh, a big uh, Indian, Asian mm. uh, communities that have been there a long time. Um, the uh, the European colonists, predominantly British and French, that you know have been, have been there a long time, and the indigenous black communities, of course, and different tribes from all over Africa, and. Uh, so it's a big melting pot of, of different cultures going on, and that's reflected in the music and in the party scene. It was a fantastic party crowd. I mean, a really up for it crowd. It actually reminded me of some of the early Goa parties in the late 80s I went to, you know, where um, things were just a little off-piste and, and certain sounds worked better than others. Um, and a really eclectic mix of people, you know, it's always good for a party. So when you're DJing, what sounds really connected with the dance floor? Would it, would it be like dub? Would it be side trance or mutations of those? I think, yeah, it's certainly uh, both of those uh, and mutations of them. But I think it was, um, a little bit more of a stripped down acid techno sound that really connected mm -hmm. um, more than the really hard trance or even some of the other dubby stuff. But, you know, I mean, a lot of that, I mean, it was, we, it was a great night. It was uh, great nights, I should say. Um, I think people just, uh, they, you know, they they're quite sophisticated in Africa, you know, they're quite, that. their ears are sophisticated, they know what's going on, they know, um, and they have a great party scene, so, um, you know, it was, uh, and they're great party people, you know, I mean, they really go for it, way more so, so than, you know, I've seen in, in the UK for a long time, so, it, it's, um, you know, it's not, for me, I was trying to fit into and um, facilitate their vibe rather than like, this is what I do, take it or leave it, you know. Oh, so um, you were kind of soaking in instead of giving out. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. And listening to other DJs and other music and radio and stuff like that. Yeah, it was great. And, um, and even now, a year later, I'm, you know, hearing that African influence in lots of different music more and more, especially trance. Mm. Listen to John Dig Digweed do a boiler room set the other night. And uh, in a whole section in the middle, the best bit actually he had his great African vocals going over a hard trance beat. Mm. And you're like, yeah, the Africa's time is now, you know, and it's well overdue. Completely. I mean, it's such what a rich culture they come to collect their debt in a sense absolutely well overdue well overdue. yeah you know like you talk about um you know goa before or jamaica in the 70s and 80s maybe this is africa's time in that that kind of sense where we always know it's there but now it's going to cross pollinate across our musics yeah and and people are open to it you know modern afro beats of dominating urban life in london and everywhere 
10 years ago, they weren't, you know. Um, so it's, um, there's something about that vibe that at this moment makes total sense. I don't know how to articulate that in a better way. But music is, great music has its time, doesn't it? Music should be, great music should be of its time. And I think great artists are very good at, you know, reinventing themselves to be able to do that, you know, from Bowie to Lee Perry, um, you know. Um, you, so you want artists to be pushing the threshold and being innovative. You don't want them sitting back on their laurels just being their own self-tribute mm -hmm. act, you know. You want to you want to see great artists. You, you need to see them pushing, you know. And um, I think uh, the the way it's happening at the moment is uh, Africa has this. I don't know, just a vibe. I just got a vibe that that the world needs. So what I find fascinating about the music that people I hear from Africa is yeah. it's, it's the, rhythmically so sophisticated, but a lot of these rhythms have been created electronically. So they, somehow they put the human into the machine, which is very difficult to do, isn't it? Well, I don't know. If you, even if you listen to early electronic punk bands like Suicide, they're very simple technology and arrangements, but they definitely got their own sound out of those electronic instruments, you know. They mm. don't sound like anybody else. Mm. Uh, and not, but that isn't easy to do. It's not easy to do with any instrument, really, is mm. to find your voice with it that, that makes, makes it unique. Um, uh, and, and like Keith Richards, that often comes from copying and playing other people's riffs that you really love until it becomes yours you know um in africa it's got that sort of ancient it began in africa thing about it, it mm. i think that speaks to all of our dna <laughs> we intuitively recognize that when we hear african singing mm. and it's also got this joyful thing not that it can't be utterly um you know melancholy and sad as well Mm. But there's this uplifting spirit to it that I suppose, you know, is where some of our more Western music, most emotional music comes from as well, like gospel music and stuff, you know. Mm. Um, so you've got all of that kind of a little closer to the source of it. That's, that's really exciting and, uh, and reconnecting. It's reconnecting to something ancient. But then you see these little kids in Soweto ghettos, Casio synths making this sort of like really speedy breakbeat sort of techno craft work program with those sort of weird, strange, um, uh, complex African rhythms. African rhythms are incredibly complex. Mm. I've got given a book I've got here in my library. It's, it's literally about that thick. Um, some guy drummer did or is his he, you know his uni theory on the po poly rhythms of African drumming and yeah, what and it was, it's just incredibly complicated and and, mm. and multi layered and multi faceted. Um, and we were only just beginning to be able to understand that with our very basic. Western um, tradition of, of of notes and, and twelve notes and you know and then of course you go even further east to India you know it goes even deeper it goes just as deeper again with all the quarter tones and, and the complex rhythms there. Um, that's amazing, isn't it? They have notes we can't hear. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And um, but. Rhythm seems to be such a big part of Africa. You talk about South African music. Is that, I can't remember the name of the top of my head. Is that the G, G Quam stuff? The, the very sparse, quite dark electronic music? No, this was, 
this was I'm, I'm referencing some tracks I had about seven, eight years ago. Um, I can't remember the name of the artist. And my friend and another producer, Matt Black, was in Africa last year as well. In the Soweto ghettos, recording and jamming with his uh, iPad, um, kids playing in, in, in their art stuff. When we went to Africa last year, was, we went to um, the Massambili uh, ghetto, which is one of the largest ones in Africa. So almost like half a million people in there. Um, and we, I, I was honoured to be a guest at an art slab there where people were singing and playing and making painting and I did a painting thing and a DJ set. And uh, what was great there was that people was, were jamming. Rap was quite big. So people would sit in, uh, in a circle playing drums, which sounded more like tradition, traditional African drumming. Um, but then they would do the sort of more modern urbanized raps on top, sometimes French, um, sometimes Swahili, sometimes English. And there was some incredible talent there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we're still, you know, I made some great connections. We're still talking and working with some of those cats. And, they, you know, what we're talking about now is, is about that and promoting that and promoting them. Um, I think um, it's an incredible source of inf inspiration for people now in the, in the world. Um, and I can see Africa opening up hugely in the, f in the next 10 years mm -hmm. as being a, a sort of, a, not just a tourist and a de destination, but a cultural destination, uh, as it should be, you know. Um, it's one of the most richest countries I've ever been to, not just in its natural beauty, but also culturally and the music and the, the people and the language is very beautiful. Yeah. Well, I, I went to Uganda 15 years ago and I went to a festival and met some wow. musicians. And the problem, the problem they had at that time was nobody had any access to any, any laptops or electronic gear. Yeah. And trying to find a way of getting them laptops to make the music. And it's very difficult. But it sounds like this must have changed that people do have access to the equipment now. So would you say that mm -hmm. society's kind of moved in a way there's, there's more space to be creative? You can, Absolutely. Can yeah. In Africa, the, the developed countries now, you know, if you look at smartphone usage in Africa, just East Africa, something like, I don't know, 400 million smartphones, mm. you know, you think UK's population is 60. Yeah. I mean, it's the same in India. And so I think for artists, the possibilities are much more appealing um, because the numbers are so much bigger for streaming revenues and things. Um, if, you, if you manage to connect. But that, that access, and, and, then, and then it's, you know, proportionally cheaper for people to get on them, so that's why they're so high. Is creating a communities and, and scenes and and, um, and some amazing things and uh, yeah when I was there there was no there was the, the guy I was who who was my sort of point of com contact there was this this guy David Cecil who started East Africa Records um, with some um, local Kampala people as well as partners. Uh, he's he's a, a Brit who moved, moved there about 25, 30 years ago. And he set up a film school. And he's made movies there and he, he got equipment and, and it's quite well respected film school. But now he does East Africa Records. And uh, yeah, he set up a studio there. It's a little basic, but it's totally able to record everything you need to. And he's a very motivated and committed person. So he's managed to really get things going there. And all the artists who came in had their own laptops and phones and were making music and have been for some years. So it's well developed. I think people don't realise how developed it is. People... I mean, there are still parts of Africa that are dealing with 
huge problems of uh, starvation and all sorts. And war, of course, still ravages big parts of Africa. And in Kampala, you're not far from um, the Congo, where there are still, you know, big wars and insurgents going on, big problems. But um, uh, it's moved on a lot of, than it what where it was ten years ago, especially twenty years ago, and the, those countries, um, like I said, are, are developed and have their own infrastructure. What needs to happen now is people begin to become more aware of what they're doing and uh, be able to support them and uh, you know uh, help them go more international with it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm sure that will happen anyway, because what they have is is unique and it is such a fresh vibe. But very hard for for people not to get into it, really. You know, the music's amazing. I've been going through uh, East Africa Records catalogue. It's, it's, yeah. it's got amazing stuff there. Mm. Do, do you, I mean, speaking of Congo, when I was there, when I was in Uganda 15 years ago, Congo was still looked on as being the driving force of African music. This is where everything was coming, especially in that middle belt of Africa. This is where everything was coming out, out of. And East Africa had, was, was known as having this very hidden underground scene. But, it was, but they looked at Congo as being the big scene and they were like this little hidden scene. But is that, has that all changed? And also, does, it, does the flavour of the music change in each? I mean, Africa's huge, of course. But the new modern electronic African music is it is it more homogenous or is it different in different parts of Africa? I think you know different parts of Africa have a unique flavour and styles, and certain things are bigger there and others. I think it's probably moved on to being Kampala as a big centre now. Nevertheless, we were working with Congolese people um, and musicians and artists, and we had this Congolese. Um, sort of pop rap pop band who were really great our africa a bunch of kids really um but they were very much more like euro pop hip-hop sort of orientated whereas some of the other artists like makosi and um they they're, they're much more like niche techno or you know they had their own singer songwriter thing going or very, very broad spectrum of uh, diversity of, of genres and styles, really. Mm. Uh, but all of them had a unique kind of African flavour, you know, mm. um, which I, so I put that down to just a vibe, really, I suppose. Would, would there yeah. be something that would define East African music at all? I know it's very eclectic, but, you know, you could sort of define... You can even define British music all the way from, say, Killing Joke to, uh, to somebody who's number one on the charts. In English, there's something, there's something quintessentially English about all of it. But East Africa, would there be something that joins it together? Or, or maybe not. Maybe it is completely fractured and different. Um, I don't know. It's because there's a lot of different languages, but sung and spoken there. Um, but... Uh, I mean, one of the most interesting artists is this girl, Monreo, who's like 20, 21, techno DJ, doing this dark, minimal techno. Fantastic. She's in Washington at the moment. Um, and, you know, what they're picking up on from European or Detroit techno culture, what they're, and then how they absorb that and reinterpret it through the lens of themselves in Africa. It's fascinating, isn't it? I mean... Mm. Um, and it goes beyond being able to sort of uh, define some of them. I always thought Killy Joke was genreless and hard to, hard to be, you know, pigeonholed. Or, but you've just used it as an example. So. <laughs> no, that's not more geographically, really. Yeah, it yeah I know what you mean. There is. Something yeah. very English about it. We're killing Joe. We actually made a point of not having American influences unless it was disco or funk. Mm -hmm. But that didn't stop us having a lot of European influences and African. I mean, we're all into Fela Kuti and Afro 
not that we were actually trying to get those rhythms down, but um, it, it's uh, we were a, a complete mashup band, I think, and the world is like that now. Everybody's into lots of different things, aren't they? Mm. So um, that's great, I think, because you could be a big Metallica fan, but you'd probably still really like Mon Ray's techno set, you know. Whereas maybe 30 years ago, you'd feel a bit guilty about liking it. You wouldn't yeah. now. <laughs> I guess for our generation, uh, punk was start the breaking down of that. And John Peel, of course, you know, the, the Clutch yeah. show took us on a Maybe that started with punk, actually. You're right. Yeah. I thought it started with Acid House, actually. But maybe punk loosened it a bit before. Some of us, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but punk can be quite um, uniform as well. And, of course, you yeah, know, of course. you know, it quickly became that, didn't it? it? Almost as soon as it was over, that's what kind of took over. Maybe, maybe we have to go back even further. Then we go back to the sixties, late sixties. George Harrison get the sitar out, which was seen revolutionary at the time, but would just seem like a just a cool thing now, wouldn't it? So maybe there's always been this quest. Well, Beatles, a good example of great artists who are constantly doing things people haven't done before and pushing the threshold mm. and challenging things. And part of that great legacy was them splitting up, you know, at their peak. Mm. In the same way as a Caleb, you know, knowing when to leave the, oh, knowing when to leave the party and leave this perfect legacy in a way. You look at the Stones, they've actually create another legacy of being one of the greatest live bands because they didn't split up. Mm. They won't have left that perfect legacy of recorded albums that the Beatles have um, because, you know, their recording, their, their recorded albums uh, haven't been so good for the last 20 years. No, they need a good uh, producer. Uh? They need a good producer. <laughs> They've got a good producer. They've got Don Was. Maybe they just need a different producer, you know. But mm. maybe that's enough. So we should just be grateful for what we get, you know. Mm. Yeah, we don't, we don't necessarily need them to make a great record because, as, as you're saying, in Africa, there's hundreds of kids making great music. We don't need the stuff. Well, that's kids. very true. That's very mm. true, yes. They've done their bit. So, uh, I mean, do you see your role going to Africa as as a producer to, to facilitate a space for these people to create. And also uh, maybe we talked about John Peel before, but as a role as an ambassador for this music to try and turn people into this country onto it and tell them the stuff's going on there. Well, initially I just went, you know, it's because I really wanted to go to Africa. You know, I was born in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So even though I never lived there, um, I left when I was very young, two months old or something. I can still feel it in my roots, so the really, opportunity of going was very exciting. And um, and I also thought, yeah, maybe I could help facilitate some music with the workshops and the recording. Um, and I think that worked very well. Got a really great response. And then afterwards, when I realised we had such great recordings, the idea of them working with East Africa Records with you sounds my label to put put it out, then that became more of an ambassador role, and you know the the whole project called Youth in Africa is an introduction for people who would know me but not necessarily any of these artists um, as a, as a kind of a you know doorway into that. Um, yeah, that's what it's become or is becoming. Um, but I you know I hope I can. Um, live up to the uh, integrity of that because, you know, they are great artists and, and they deserve the, an international uh, worldwide success and attention. So I'm happy, more than happy to facilitate that. I mean, uh, virus pending, are you planning to go back out there and continue the project? Well, I think he plans to take Alex to the Orb out. Well, they were planning that for September, October. I don't know if that's going to happen now. Mm -hmm. But certainly we were talking about maybe going back next year and doing some more. I'd be more than happy to do that. The DJ set you're going to play, what, kind of, what can we be expecting you to be playing? Well, you know what? 
I started, I was, I'm not sure if I can do it live, if I'm technically able to do it live. So I'm doing a pre-recorded one in case I can't. Mm-hmm. And I started that last night and I kind of went a bit techno. Um, and I quite like that. Techno kind of feels right at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, but normally what I'd be doing for psychedelic disco is just some banging psychedelic electronic dance music, you know. So certainly going to be a lot of that. Um, and then maybe I may, I may put some of that techno in as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's funny how different times require different sounds. It's a, Mm-hmm. It never stays still, does it? Or if it does, it's not for long. That wheel keeps turning, and mm-hmm. and it, it's, it, you see it reflected in the culture from punk to rave or whatever. Those things may endure and carry on in their own way, but other things come in their wake. And what is that? Is that evolution, John, or is that just? Yeah, I, think, um, I think you can't help itself. No matter what you try and do musically what's in your subconscious will always come out won't it so so you what the times you're in will get reflected in the music you're making what's interesting about the virus times is will people make loads of really claustrophobic introverted stuck in for three month records or will they do the complete opposite that's true yeah Yeah, i I found personally being in isolation i found i've done a bit of both and i made quite a bit of disco and stuff and funk but, mm. but I've also been doing these quite heavy, sonorous, dark, uh, introverted piano pieces and things like that. Um, yeah, and it, it, you can only tell in hindsight really what it is that mm. defines it. I hope there's not going to be too much um, soul ringing introversion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> because we've all had enough of that, I think. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, but it, it will be interesting to see how it's represented um, and what what what's come out of it. You must have found um, you've had a bit of a deepening through these times yourself, as many people have. I'm sure you would have yourself. Have you started your great Dostoevsky novel as a result of this? Or uh, finishing off writing two other books, so uh, I finally have the time to get them done, all the editing done. Yeah. yeah. But has, just, has anything grabbed you and taken you sideways that you thought you wouldn't have done otherwise? I've been doing a lot of music, but a lot of little side projects, just co-writing with lots of different people. So we got this track coming out with Sean Ryder. I was doing Peter Murphy just before lockdown. How was that? Oh, it sounds fantastic. And uh, I've had you know, different members of Tool overdubbing parts to it in LA and stuff at home during lockdown. That sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah it's great. It reminds me of a Kubrick thing. You know, when Kubrick was um, doing Eyes Wide Shut, he employed a nephew or something of his to photograph every door in the old Kent Road as a potential door for the prostitute's house in one of the scenes. <laughs> this guy, this kid, had to do it on a step ladder, and this kid spent three months doing it every single day. It's a really long road, and then, and then, of course, Kubrick didn't get back to him for six months, and then summoned him up to the, the film set one day and set him up so I can see them all. And he set them all up on on a, a eye high along this big sort of exhibition type stands. Kubrick comes in with his art designer and they, they're going, they're looking at all these doors and Kubrick goes, wow, sure beats going there, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 and then decides not to use any of them and they, they, they just build a, a set of a, of a brownstone door. <laughs> it's the thing intriguing about creating with people you don't meet, isn't it? I don't know. I did. It's that introvert extrovert thing. You can't have one without the other, in, in a way. Oh, but, that's um, weaknesses. Yeah, it's. Uh, I lo- You know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I can go that far, but I like it when other people do. You know, sometimes. Mm. Yeah, th- yeah. Th- it's it's just a different way of working. It just throws different curveballs in, which is always good, isn't it? 
you know, being in a room with people, everyone's playing really loud. <laughs> so you sort of lose your original idea, don't you? Well, that's right. That's right. So it's not always that should really. That, I mean, that's the detail of what you've already decided you're doing, isn't it? You know, how do we make this door? You know, yeah. yeah. How far do we go to get this door right? <laughs> and what is the right door? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he either knew or he didn't have a clue. <laughs> yeah. Bar <laughs> going to New York to film it because he filmed it all in London and he didn't want to fly. What's yeah. the best thing we can do, you know, um, to get an authentic door? It's Again, it's about authenticity, isn't it, really? Which is, but which is you're on a film set. So you can, it's make-believe, so yeah. I love that. That's another paradoxical dynamic, isn't it? The actual making of it is more interesting than the final product. Well, it's the same with music. We're in a virtual reality already in a studio, aren't we? It's not, it's mm. not a gig, it's a studio. You know, it's not a real New York prostitute store. It's an actor with a pretend one. But when you watch the movie, or listen to the song, you you want to believe mm. that it is. Well, that's what's fascinating, isn't it? And it's that yeah. it's, it's so bizarre when people go on about real records, you know, that sound real. Yeah. Never, or, or people who only buy records of vinyl and they won't listen to anything that's digital. And I have to tell them all the files that made that piece of vinyl were emailed to the... Uh, pressing plants so it already went, it's already digital before it was vinyl <laughs> it's the search for auth uh, authenticity in a plastic world is is why especially young people find it important for them and i think um i think that's fair enough it's, it could be commended really i mean if they can buy coffee that hasn't um that's been sailed over by a ship and has no environmental impact rather than one that's been driven by a diesel truck. Mm. That's better, isn't it? In a, in a lot of ways. Um, but we, yeah, in a sense. yeah, I don't know if that's a good analogy, but it's, <laughs> I think it's the idea of authenticity, isn't it? You know, and, um, and I, so I think even for actors, especially for actors, you know, playing a part, which is obviously, fictionalized part, role, uh, personality, so they still have to find some, a true authenticity in the expression for mm. it to be believable, right? Or even entertaining, you know? And that brings it back to Peter Murphy, who is, uh, he is quite, he's a good actor really, isn't he? Yeah. Every, every artist is, aren't they? Mm. You know, because, we're getting quite deep now. It's like, who are <laughs> you? you know, <laughs> um, and you know, every every artist knows that they're wearing a mask. You know, that's the oldest art is the idea of theatre, putting on the mask. It's shamanic as well. This is the fascinating thing for me, and we're killing joke is is that it is magic. And the paradoxical thing happens when you put on that mask and you pretend that persona and that energy becomes very real. Mm. In a way, it becomes more real than real. Yeah. Is that mm. possible? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe everything else is an act and that's the only reality. Well, there you go. Now, now, now we're getting into the realm of psychedelics <laughs> as well. You know. Yeah. Um, but, and deep philosophy, but, you know... Um, the basic tenet of Tibetan Buddhism, isn't it? You know, and uh, the, you know, it takes an illusion for us to realise our own illusion. You know, sometimes, you know. And how much of this plays back into the African experience? I know you're you're only there for five days, but would those themes play out there as well in a different way? Well, one, well, you know, what's fascinating in Africa and especially Uganda because colonisation gets so deep rooted there um, nor the, all the missionaries that retained their culture and the indigenous uh, the, uh, native culture much um, I, you can see um, like when we when we did that when, when we did one of the 
parties raised, they brought in a rainmaker to make sure it didn't rain. <laughs> and of course, we had torrential rainfall. <laughs> <laughs> But the importance on the rainmaker was was significant, and I thought, oh, that's great that there, there's a respect for that still. Mm. And of course, when people play and dance, we all take on the role, take on different personas and roles depending on the music and the time and the place and the context. Regardless of being, um, you know, on a stage, everybody's performing a. a an event like that and those go back to our deep dna you know our ancient dna of um being human they're the part of our more most human elements and the best part of our human elements is what brings us together and good brings community facilitates falling in love and all those things and uh, there's a magic that happens when that kicks off and, and goes right. Mm. And um, we still, nobody really knows what that is, but everybody knows it when it's happening. Mm. Instinctive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's palpable. The hairs go up and, you know, yeah, and it goes beyond just the individual musicians, although sometimes it doesn't, but often it does, and it's a collective high. Mm. Um, but uh, sometimes certain musicians, Bob Marley, people like that, they just, the prism for it all as well. But, um, you know, that's, I've had many experiences like that. That's what makes me believe in the power of music. And also, I think, as you mentioned early on, the, the great transparency of music, and music doesn't lie, music is what it is. You can hear it. If it's kind of fake, banal, it will sound that. If it's sincere and uh, authentic, it'll sound like that as well. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't necessarily uh, mean you have to be, if you're Scottish, you, you just sing Scottish folk songs, or if you're Jamaican, you just make reggae music. And it's about what really speaks to you in your heart, emotionally, and your authenticity to that. And, and that, gives you um you know infinite amount of possibilities i think and that's really it's still really exciting and still mind-blowing to me when i hear it and see it and, yeah